Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I am your humble host, Coach Jason Coop, and this episode of the podcast is about a subject that I have wanted to discuss for a very long time, but I have not had the guts to do so. And also, I really haven't found the right dance partner to work with me on the other side of the mic to talk about something that is extremely important and also topical as this year's Winter Olympics is now unfolding. And that is the aspect of mental health and particularly mental health with athletes. And so what I decided to do is I wanted to bring on one of our fellow coaches, Neil Palace, who a lot of you podcast listeners will recognize Neil from his appearance on the Trainwright podcast with Coach Corinne Malcolm. I will link that in the show notes. But in addition to be a fantastic ultra running and endurance coach, Neil also has a dual master's degree in social work and applied sports psychology, and he's also a licensed psychotherapist and sports performance specialist. And so I could think of no better person to help me get my feet wet a little bit talking about things like this publicly than somebody that I work with, somebody that I trust, and somebody that also works with athletes in a capacity that I work with athletes with and also has clinical and relevant experience in this area, working with people and helping them to improve their mental health. I really enjoyed this conversation with Neil. I did not know where it was going to go. I gave him the reins to kind of go with it wherever he wanted to go with it because he is the expert in this and I certainly am not. And overall, what I want the listeners to come away with is a toolkit that they can take into their everyday life. So if they know somebody who is struggling or if they themselves or they themselves are struggling, you can use pieces within that toolkit to navigate this kind of weird and bizarre and in and, and, and a landscape that I think that this comes out in the podcast that is sometimes difficult to navigate. And then in addition to that, I wanted the listeners to understand that all of this is okay. We can normalize mental health and bring it into the conversation just like we do normalize graded pace and just like we do lactate levels and vert and things like that. We can make this a part of conversation that we can all talk about and we will all be the better for it. So with that as a backdrop, folks, I'm going to get right out of the way. Here's my conversation about mental health with Coach and licensed psychotherapist and sports performance specialist, Neil Palace. I'm recording this in my van for the people who aren't watching this on YouTube. And whenever whenever that is the case, my familiarity with what's going on in the outside world just kind of comes like in and out of consciousness almost, right? Because I get connectivity and then I can like come back into the real world and, you know, my feeds blow up with everything. But seriously, I pulled, I pulled over to this parking lot to record this podcast. <laughs> This is like, oh, this wow. is, this is really recent. So this is not on your outline, <laughs> but uh, we'll okay. go with it. I'm using it as the intro, so you won't have to opine on it. So I pulled this parking lot to record this intro and I pulled up like my, my newsfeed and on CNBC, the top story that I have is Olympic snowboarder, Sean White on being, on being vulnerable with mental health quote, it is not a weakness. And so yes. yeah, so Sean White, right, arguably the most famous snowboarder in the world. We kind of yes. go on and on with Chloe Kim, right, who's a snowboarder, who's also been very uh, public about this as well. Naomi Osaka, uh, uh, who's a professional tennis player, as well as the most kind of recent Summer Olympics with Simone Biles. There, there have been a number of high profile athletes that have started to be more like honest and open about this aspect of mental health, which I think for yes. a lot of the practitioners like yourself in the space has been a little bit of a breath of fresh air because it gives you that appeal to authority, right? That, um, that, that ultimately these Absolutely. are things that, that high profile, high performing people actually struggle with as well. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but I thought I would bring it up since it was so topical because it really yeah. does seem like every week there's a new, you know, there's some new story about this. Um, but since we are talking about mental health, and this is a conversation that I've wanted to have for a, for a very long time on this podcast. And 
I've honestly kind of struggled personally to kind of pull the trigger on it because I realize that I'm not an expert on it and I don't like to wade too deep into waters like these where I don't have any legitimate amount of expertise. And this is certainly yeah. one of those cases. It's the same thing with like eating disorders and things like that. I, I, I tread on, I tread those waters very, very cautiously. And so I wanted to bring you on the podcast, Neil, to, to discuss this because you've got kind of a really cool angle on this, right? Where you, uh, you work in the mental health space, but also you're a coach. And so you can yes. kind of ping pong back and forth between these two worlds and you and people like yourself are probably some of the few people in the space that can a readily identify with the high performing athletes that have these big name stories, but also can take it down to the level of what I'll call the everyday athlete that might be dealing with these issues as well. But before we get into that, like, can you go over your background a little bit? So it doesn't seem like I'm just bringing some random coach on here to talk about this. Cause that's <laughs> really, that's really, really, really important in this area. It's very important. I think. Um, so I'm going to start over here and then I'm going to go backwards and then forwards. <laughs> so I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, and I have been licensed for 20 years. Uh, I let's go back a, Billion years ago, early 90s, I went and got an undergrad in psychology. I wanted to help people somehow. And I, I fell in love with the outdoors um, and working outside and teaching things like rock climbing, backpacking, and mountaineering. And so I got into this program called Outward Bound, worked for Outward Bound for 15 seasons off and on during the summers, teaching climbing, backpack mountaineer, doing all this stuff and wanted to figure out where I wanted to go next and how I could help empower people. And I said, well, you know, social work is a, is a place to do that. I'll, I'll go into school social work. And that never happened. But I got my master's degree in social work. And um, I you know, got licensed and started working for actually doing crisis work. And I still do a lot of crisis work for employee assistance programs and large behavioral health organizations. And so I have seen kind of the gamut of behavioral health uh, situations coming in um, from a lot of different levels. And what I got really good at, and, you know, I don't know how much I've ever talked about this with you or anybody else, uh, but um, I got really good at is consulting with managers uh, and consulting about workplace uh, issues and, and stuff you know, where some serious stuff happens in the workplace. You know, you know, it could be violence in the workplace, could be drug addictions in the workplace, lots of stuff coming there into that level. So I worked in crisis and then do have a private practice starting around 2006, kind of went in and out of that, had a child and uh, still work for behavioral health, but also have a private practice. In there, I fell in love with this idea of sports psychology, you know, and really kind of getting into the performance piece of it and decided, found a, 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 a um, uh, a program in 2016, went to a program in 2016, graduated in 2019 from another program. So I got a second master's degree in uh, applied sports psychology. So I can kind of overlap this sport piece. All the meantime, I'm still getting active in the outdoors, running and stuff. And, uh, you know, just, I, I love the learning, you know, and dug into that too. But clinically, that's where I come from. You know, and I, I, I'm actually a supervisor for a large employee assistance program during my day job. So I do, I got a lot of hats. I, I was about to say, there's like 10 <laughs> hats right lot. there that we can, <laughs> if, if we were fortunate enough to bring you on as a coach for CTS, one of our newer ultramarathon coaches, uh, remind me again when that was, Neil, seems like two months ago now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. October, uh, no, yeah. August actually, yeah. And you've been a lifelong endurance athlete. I want to, yeah, I mean, I, I look back and, you know, I look back, well, I've been running since high school and, um, you know, went, you know, did the high school track and stopped when I started getting into the outdoors and was just, but continued to run, stop track and field and start continue to run and have been doing marathon, running marathons since about 2000 and uh, ultras since 2014, where I just, 
<laughs> so you know you know the space i guess is what i'm saying we're just we're talking offline about you consistently doing the lead man which is all yeah. of the leadville events <laughs> yeah I, you know, and now you're taking I, a break gonna, and you're just doing like 20 events this year yeah <laughs> it's just 20 events no, it's, just, it's only like two or three it's only like three so far <laughs> You know, so far, it's February I'm, though. We'll give you time. It's February. The, okay. There, there was a mountain bike race I was kind of looking at, going, "Ah, oh, gee whiz, you know, that's no, 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 no." Okay, so that that's a perfect backdrop, Neil, because this this uh, vision that you have now painted for the listeners, where you are, where you have all of this varying levels of education and professional development, and you wear all of these different hats. I think the conversation that I want to have with you is basically going to stack all those hats on top of each other and like alchemize them into one because we're going to talk about athletes very specifically, endurance athletes and probably ultramarathon athletes uh, very specifically, yeah. their mental health, what are some of the pitfalls and how can they leverage their support system around them to make sure that they're on the right side of that line, right? And that support system, I can already tell from your facial expression, <laughs> is, is, is going to be a big one. Um, uh, can so I bring I my wife on to talk to me? <laughs> talk to about this. Oh, uh, you bring in the whole village, you know? I remember we, exactly. my my conversation with uh, Kristen Keim, who I, I don't know if you're yeah. uh, familiar with that one that I had with yep. her, but that's her big phrase, right? Is it, it, it takes a village. And I'll link that uh, podcast up in the show notes for those of you who uh, who have not seen it. It was one of the first podcasts I did, probably one of the first twenty episodes that I did. Um, but as I as I mentioned with, as I mentioned in the intro, a lot of times, and I think very fortunately, this gets thrust into the spotlight during the most heated and competitive athletic events on the planet. So think like the NBA finals or the yeah. Olympics or Wimbledon and these very, very bright spotlights that are cast down upon these athletes with all the millions and millions of eyes that are on them during these competitions. And the fact that a few of them have, have not a few, but I would say several recently have finally kind of come out and said, Hey, listen, this is something that I struggle with. And Michael Phelps is now a, a, a spokesperson for an app, right? Where you can get right. connected with a licensed, uh, licensed therapist. And that wasn't the case. I mean, geez, Neil, five or six years ago, it almost seems no. like, I mean, this is, this no. is something that's really, really relevant. Um, but I first want to get your take on it from this hybrid from this hybrid coach and practitioner perspective is how can the everyday athlete look at these types of situations and, and really try to relate that to whatever they are going through? Because we, you know, we like to put these elite athletes on a pedestal and yeah, it's nice that they're, you know, real human beings and things like that. But sometimes the relatable points are things that, athletes kind of struggle with and even athletes that that I know who have been open about their mental health issues whenever they see a big time athlete open up about the same thing it's even hard for them to relate to it right, right. because it seems like that person is just on a different planet uh, than, than they are so what would you say to the athletes who are casually watching all of these things transpire and trying to find some relatable point to them you're seeing the humanness in them. You're seeing the vulnerability. You're seeing, wait a second, you know, this person out there struggles too. And for years and years and years, you know, we haven't seen that. You know, we haven't seen it because we, you know, we're, we're, you know, there's this, you know, this layer of, you know, we got to be stoic and, you know, can't share this stuff they have the, you know, being, they're being incredibly vulnerable being on that stage to begin with. And now to be able to say, hey, I've got this going on. That's okay for us to talk about. And, you know, we get this, you know, there, there, I think there's, there, there's many gray areas, many, many sides, many polarities uh, on, on this issue of, you know, we don't talk about this stuff, but wait a second by having people start to talk about this is opening a door saying, uh, sharing this humanity in all of us that, Hey, maybe it's okay that, that, I, that I'm experiencing this. Cause Hey, this person over there is, you know, 
certainly there's other people, you know, you know, and certainly I could be okay sharing, you know, having that experience too, you know, and it's okay to talk about it. Yeah. That's my, that's my sense. If they're, if they are at the highest of levels and I think, I think the more important point with this is they've made it to the highest of levels, right? Yeah. And that they, for whatever reason, have gone through whatever they're going through and still are able to make it to the highest level. That's incredibly poignant. And I think, uh, it's incredible. and it's incredible. Yeah. So why is it? Why is that so incredible? I mean, we could take it from well, an athletic standpoint, and I look at it as just to get close to that level. Yeah. Everything has to go right. You have to have the genetic lottery. You have to have the right. environmental lottery. You have to not get injured. You have to have the support system around you. And yes, athletes absolutely forge almost all of those. But it is yeah. a very rare constellation of events to happen to get to the Simone Biles levels, to get to the Michael Phelps levels, to get to the, to the Naomi Osaka level. And if you were to think about that, any headwind that is in the way could potentially preclude that person to getting to that level. So totally. like, why, so that's the athletic standpoint, but why else is that so remarkable? You know, you know see if I can express this in words. Um, you know, I think, you know, you know, you know, as we come back, you know, come back to the idea of mental health, you know, in this, is that even at that level, you, you, you things go wrong. Things uh, inside aren't always perfect, you know, and they're still a human being. Yeah, you have to have all this stuff going right, and you have to have a lot of stuff together, but at the same time, you're okay in having these struggles. You're gonna have this day where it's like, I'm, I'm off, you know, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna perform well, you know, and that's okay. You know, if you, you know, if we could learn from that, if we could see these people, you know, over here, you know, who are doing these incredible things, that they're struggling, to, they have these struggles too. And then I, you know, I go and do lead man and, you know, and I just have just a bad, race or I don't finish my race there's nothing wrong with me you know there's nothing you know it's like you know it was a bad race I you know yeah I'm like I'm gonna take the time to to cry and mourn for that I'm also gonna say okay you know what's the next step you know maybe if I'm hooked on it and I'm gonna go and get some help which is a good thing to do am I making sense to you there is it yeah Yeah, I mean, I think it's give yourself a little bit of grace, right? And what you're doing, th- th- here's the relatable point that I that, that I take away from the elite athletes. And yes, they've had to have everything go right. But for an everyday athlete, you can try to make everything go right to get to the place where you want to do a sub nine hour led the trail 100 mountain bike right or 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 make it to the finish line in under (laughs) 12 hours right i mean you can can absolutely and people are like pouring their hearts and souls and into their training you will still have headwinds training is not perfect and even when it's really really good the outcome is uncertain right even in the best of training cycles even in the best and and because of that uncertainty, yeah, there's a chance that you're going to line up and you're not going to do as good as you as you thought you're going to do. But you know yes. what? It's a race. It's a race. There's, you know, there's things, you know, it's mastering the controllables. You know, you talk about it. And I think emotionally, you know, I'll talk, I'll talk about it in mental health. You know, what can you control for yourself right now? You know, you've got control of your hands, your legs, your arms, for the most part, you know, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it, you control these things, you control what you say, you control what you do. And, you know, some bad stuff happens some days, you know, and you get, you know, and sometimes there's a, a lot of bad stuff that's happening. And what can you do in that space to, Take care of yourself. Some of that might be coming to see someone like me, 
you know, like account, you know, therapist. And some of it might be, you know, okay, you know, you're able to kind of move back the next day and, and get back up and, and keep training. But, you know, like, like you said, there's so much stuff that happens during training, you know, so many variables. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's pull on let's pull let's pull on that a little bit because i think yeah. that you know the audience out here they need help they, they need help navigating this right and from a lot okay. of different areas because you know, we we we're experiencing this right now yeah everybody has gone through the lottery process they put their names into all of these various hats okay. and then their season kind of shakes out and the ones that for whatever reason think that that coaching athletic coaching is going to resonate with them they sign up for coaching right yeah. and they've somehow they've somehow made that internal decision that hey coaching is right for me i just got into the western states 100 i'm going to go find a coach to help me kind of overperform for that i i don't know the answer to this question and so i'll ask you as the expert i don't know if the same ease of navigation that i just went through that you know that i just went through with that dialogue is the same with mental health, meaning some things happen, right? And in the athletic case, it's the lottery season, right? Yeah. And then they resonate with, I think I'm going to need a coach, and then they find a coach. What's the parallel to that in the mental oh. health in the mental health world? A huge parallel, I think. Yeah, tremendous. Because you know, I almost wonder if it's easier for people to say, I'm going to get a coach. You know, and oh, deal sure. with the you know, deal. I'm going to go ahead. I got this going on. I'm going to go ahead and deal, you know, and get a coach to help me perform better. But, you know, and even and this is, you know, says a lot about executive coaching. They'll go get an executive coach, for example, for, you know, they're experiencing anxiety in the workplace or something, and they'll get an executive coach because they can't, they won't see a therapist. So it's much easier for people to say, well, I'm going to go to go see it, go work with a coach because it's still an incredibly huge stigma. What do people have to go through? Ah, it, you know, it depends. <laughs> How's that for an answer? I mean, that's what I want to know, right? Yeah. I mean, I think this wants to it's, know is, is like what things transpire to say, oh, you know what, I need to get this checked out or you know what, I need to encourage my friends to get this checked out. You know, I wish it nothing would have to transpire. <laughs> I wish they would just go and, you know, and, and this isn't trying to, you know, bring people in to see therapists. Oh, we all need, yeah. but you should be going to see a therapist just as you would go in for your regular checkup. That, you know, it's that nothing should transpire. So what ends up happening for a lot of people is you end up having to go through a lot of crises and hitting a lot of walls and, finally, you know, well, maybe I'll give this a shot. Maybe they'll go see one therapist. And if that one therapist they didn't connect with, then they don't, you know, they may not go back, but maybe they get that therapist who gives them, you know, they, they get a little bite on that and they go back the next time and they get a little bit more and go, wait a second, you know, this, this is, I'm learning something here about myself and maybe I can get a little bit more out of that. I mean, it, it varies tremendously. I, I just read a statistic. It was one in four people who are quote unquote struggling actually go in to see a therapist. I don't wish I knew exactly where that statistic came in, came from, um, but it's one in four who are maybe struggling with depression or anxiety. Um, maybe it's an eating disorder. One in four will actually reach out and get that help. What does it take? <sighs> a lot a lot um so how sometimes. do you get it how do you get it no <laughs> but but here's the thing guys because i ultimately want to yeah. help people right and so when yeah, i yeah. hear that that it takes a lot yeah to get somebody to f even consider seeking out the right help right nonetheless finding the right help and then having that right help actually execute into something meaningful exactly but what i want to try to do is understand how people out there or even myself as a coach can reduce those steps such that 
there's less yes. there's less struggle to get help, right? Or there are le- there are fewer walls to get up, or maybe that's inevitable. That's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to kind of like uncover here, since this isn't that's, really my and house. that's that's one of my goals coming into this field as a social worker and it, actually in the field of coaching too is kind of integrate some of this stuff into coaching is is that first of all part of it's going to be education and understanding that it, you know th- these are things that are okay to talk about providing that hey you know that this is okay you and i will go in to see a therapist that's okay um Part of it's creating the accessibility and and make and then educating people about where do you find these resources? Where do you find a therapist? Where do you find? Um, and then being patient enough to search around, look under different stones. I know right now we are you know where we are in the country right now is is a mental health crisis, and it is very very hard for a lot of people to get in to see a therapist. And so there's a lot of, but there's a lot of different ways and you have to be really somewhat resourceful, but also um, uh, persistent in, in contacting people, calling people, interviewing therapists, interviewing, talking to people on the phone. As a coach, I think it's a good idea to have a list, you know, of people that are maybe local to you, you know, locally, Maybe you know somebody nationally. Maybe you know somebody who knows somebody and can help navigate that system for you to, or, you know, work, you know, you know, these are some of the people to go to. But we have those lists like a, a physical therapist, a list of physical therapists. We should also have that list of psychotherapists I, as well. I was yeah. kind of making that analogy too, but Neil, like when you just went through that, Okay. The thing that comes to my mind is that's a lot of work yeah. and the accessibility or the lack of accessibility because all of the hoops you have to jump through or the work that you have to do or whatever, that seems like it kind of like perpetuates the problem. Yeah. And fortunately, you know, I'm not, a, <laughs> you know, it, we may need to edit this part here, but you know, I, I'm, I see it as a huge problem right now. And, you know, I see it in my day-to-day job where we place 20 phone calls for somebody to get somebody in to see a counselor. And it's really hard, but, you know, there, there are other tools out there that can be helpful. And definitely in the realm of, you know, for athletes, for example, um, you know, I know, you know, there's, there's a program uh, called Bigger Than the Trail, which offers free counseling for athletes. Um, and actually, I'm an ambassador for that, for them. Um, so Bigger Than the Trail, you go to their website, bttt.run, and they you scroll down and they'll actually have, if you need to be connected with a therapist, they'll connect you with a therapist. Um, so there are, there are ways it, it, it can be challenging sometimes, but this is where, you know, um, knowing that the help is definitely out there. It, it, sometimes, you, you know, you're calling your insurance company, you're going to get a list of names. You have to go through all those names. Yeah. You know, have to go through all of them. I, you know, yeah, I, I, you know, sorry for this kind of you know, sad no. piece of it, but I think it's, I think it's important to know, but it, I know that help is out there. But the, but I think the listeners, one of the things that they can take away from this is, is is that, that if you want to help somebody that you think is struggling, or if you're in that position and you want to go find help, expect it to work, have some work associated with it. Like you're going to have to, these things don't grow on trees. It's not going to fall and, you know, hit you on the top of the head, like a lightning bolt or anything like that. Like you're going to have to put in a little work. And yes, that's tragic that you probably have to put in more work than, than, than you should because of the accessibility issues that you were mentioning earlier. Right. But I, I think, you know, if you, I think by setting the expectations up that you're going to have to do a little, little bit of legwork, you're going to have yes. to interview a few, if not several therapists to find one that is the right one for you. You're right. going to have to badger your insurance company if you make any headway with them at all. 
badger your insurance company, badger <laughs> your EAP. I will, I will encourage that forever. Because <laughs> <laughs> there are, so to be fair, there are people on the other side of the phone. They are truly out there to help you. I know that yeah. from personal experience, but you, you know, you may need to have to pick up the cup phone. You may have to look at psychology today as an example. That's a great website where you can just find names of different therapists and just go through the list. And usually on psychology today, they'll list, you know, am I taking new clients or not? And that's another good way to go through that. So here's my selfish question as a coach. I'm the host here, so I can ask selfish questions to just, to, just, just, to, just to entertain, just to entertain myself here. Dig. But I think I do think there's a relevant, a relevant point for the audience here, is that people out there listening, they they'll that that believe that they have good mental health, they will still know somebody that they want to help, and right. I have. I have had athletes on my roster where this is, you know, something that I've had to, you know, not had to, but I, I have tried to help them navigate. There are other coaches out there that have gone through the exact same thing, training partners, friends, family, you know, the list kind of goes like on and on and on. We all know people we are all kind of like humans and things like that. What are people who are out there that are listening to this that want to help a friend or a family member or a training partner? or one of their athletes that they work with, what, what do they kind of like need to like watch out for? Or are there any sort of telltale signs? And how do they go about approaching the individual that they want to help with this? Hey, I want to help you out. Because that's a big barrier as well. Right? Yeah, the onlookers wanting to come in because they don't know how to navigate the space either. That's why I'm that's why I have you on the podcast yeah. right here. So yeah. take the listeners kind of like through that, like friends, family, colleagues, runners, how do we help those people? Um, normalize it, you know, normalize it, normalize it, empathize with them, you know, join with them. And what I mean by that is, you know, hey, you know, you know, and this is me as, <laughs> you know, Coop, I see you hurting right now. It's, I see you're really struggling with this. You know, I know, uh, you know, I've struggled with this personally, or I've known other people struggle with this. And, you know, just getting in to see a therapist might be really helpful. I've gone in, you know, here's, here's a therapist that I use, you know, here's a couple of names. Uh, this might be really helpful for you. But, you know, this is struggling with this stuff is normal. So identifying, first of all, what are, are they hurting? You know, would you see someone hurting, you know? You're going to feel something probably inside a little bit and noticing that and naming that for yourself and helping them to identify that. This is, and that's, a, that's so challenging. That's so challenging, especially with someone, you know, as a, as a coach, you may not know this person as well, you know, but what, you know, for example, you know, as you know, I'll, I'll kind of go from my perspective, my wife's perspective on me. For example, you know, who years ago was just overtraining, just, you know, going ballistic, hundred, you know, way too many hours, you know, have a family. Hey, you know, do you notice what's going on here? You know, let's, let's, I know this is really hard, but, you know, what do you think? You, you know, do you think you can get in and get some help? Can you, can you do that for me? You know, that might be another aspect. But noticing what's going on when you're feeling that is identifying the, emo you know, identifying the emotion and helping them to name that. It's going to be really hard. This mm -hmm. isn't easy. This isn't easy. But I, the more that you're able to even just, you know, suggest or encourage or go, hey, here's a couple of names. I'm, you know, I'm worried about you. I want to make sure you're doing okay. These are great resources right here, you know. Even if you do some of the legwork for that person, get on psychology, to get on the insurance, you know, you know, uh, you know, get some names of people, talk to friends. Who do you know? Who do you see? Okay, that's a good person to go to. Let's go, let's try that name. You know, it's hard, but you know, the more you do that, the more you get in the habit of doing that, the easier that gets. Yeah. You, you start breaking down these walls. 
It's uh, so from a coaching standpoint, I think one of the reasons a lot of endurance coaches don't have a very good eye on this, and this is my opinion, I can step up on the soapbox for a second, is that we are used to letting data drive our decisions. And whether that data comes in the form of a power meter or looking at somebody's normalized graded pace or aerobic decoupling or even the comments, right? We had this conversation in our coaching group the other day, just looking at the yeah. comments and training peaks and using that as like actual visual data. I felt good. I felt bad. My legs felt great. Like just seeing that, right? Seeing that very visual, tangible interpretation of what is going on inside of the athlete, right? External, externally manifesting itself into a green stop light, or a green go light, a red stop light, a yellow caution light. I feel good. I feel bad. Like that's a very visual representation of all of these internal things that are kind of going on with the athlete. Absolutely. With mental health, it's those are, I'm not going to say that they're not there because they are right. They come out in language, they come out in conversation, it comes out in body language and things like that, but it's not as abrupt as, Oh, well, your heart rate variability is crap today, right? You know, I mean, those, those kinds of things, it's kind of like easy, right? When you when yeah. you look at it. And it, I don't know where exactly I was going with that conversation, but just to more back up the statement that you made that it's hard work to peel that up to peel that open, right? You've got to know yeah. the person you've got to really pay attention, you've got to understand what right. normal dialogue is for them. And then and then if you have done all of those, then you're kind of in a position to say, hey, what's going on? If you don't know what's going on in the first place, you right. have no basis for when it's going astray. Exactly, exactly. You know, and I, I, could, I could ask athletes to, I mean, that's why Training Peaks could be so good, could be such a great resource. You could ask them to communicate, and put that information in, you check in with athletes a couple, once a week or twice a week, you know, whatever you're doing. But if you don't have that, establishing that relationship, it, you know, I think is key. And it, it's harder the further removed from it. Like you said, you're looking at these numbers. You can't really tell. You can tell when somebody, hey, wait a second. I put you down for an hour run. You went for an hour and a half. <laughs> you, you did three hours instead of two hours. What, you know, let's talk about that. What's happening here? You know, um, you know, I noticed you really pushed it the other day. You know, what's, let's let's have a conversation about that and you got to listen you know and and that's hard if we're not you know if we're just looking at the data you know and that's where you know that, that yeah sometimes in that 20 minute phone call and i can't say i mean honestly as a coach it, it's definitely coming at an interesting angle you know yeah i'd love to you know if i had to refer someone hopefully they would be able to come to me and ask me you know but you're, you're looking at data and you're connecting with them for 20 minutes a week. We are looking at the tip of the tip of the iceberg sometimes. Yeah. And for some of us, some of us, you, you know, you may have a lot more interaction with some of your athletes you know, than I would. Uh, and, and it gives you a little bit more opportunity than I would to ask those questions. But I use the coaching one. And I realize yeah. that not everybody is a coach. I, I kind of yeah. use that in this situation or in, in this circumstance as a little bit of an analogy for day-to-day -day life, right? Like I know my athletes through their athletic endeavors, first and foremost, right? right? They come to me, I'm going to train for X, Y, Z event. And then I get to know them as a person, as a father, as a wife, as a, you know, CEO, kind of whatever, kind of whatever they are. But I think the other people that are training partners, that are friends, that are colleagues can kind of like use that as a little bit of analogy. They have this one frame of reference for that particular person. I work with this person. Right. Like they sit next to me in the cubicle. I go in, we go into a meeting, we, you know, shoot the shit while we're at the water cooler. But they can use that personal relationship and extrapolate it into other areas because we're all human. We're all kind of, innate, right. you know, innately curious about what's going on there. So I would say, even if you're not a coach out there and you have, you know, friends, co friends, colleagues, running partners, and things like that, you still have. A robust enough human skill set. If you listen, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. I'll let you go. I'll let you go uh, on that. So yes, what listen. were you saying this about? <laughs> yeah, well, listening, listening, and you know, and feeling, you know, and that's oh god, you know, that's that's a hard one for some of us too, you know, and 
and it, but it's recognizing what's going on in that dialogue, even that, you know, say hey, something's off. Maybe I need to ask a question, you know, hey, is everything going okay? You know, you talk about the water cooler, that's a great one, you know, you know, in the workplace, you know, the people that I've worked with in the workplace, I mean, they could see it right there. Once COVID hit, it's been a lot harder, right. Right. a lot harder. Uh, we just had a meeting today for the first time in a year and a half that was actually over Zoom, you know, and that's with a bunch of mental health therapists, oh you know, gosh. and so it's like, wow, you know, I can see this person, you know, and that, but it's, but it's having a, but you're going to have day to day interactions with runners, with, you know, cyclists, whoever you're having that interaction with, you know, tr trust your instinct. And this was, this was really, uh, you know, this is, this is a story I like to tell. So years ago, tw over 20 years ago, when I'm going into school, I was actually in an internship in a hospital downtown Chicago. And my, you know, this first couple of weeks doing this internship and I'm going into these, you know, these uh, hospital rooms and uh, my, my, um, my supervisor, she asked me, what did you feel? I, uh, because in a conversation with somebody, you might be able to feel something. Learning to identify what that is, is kind of getting to this realm of emotional intelligence and being able to identify that was fear. You know, that was anxiety. That was, and some people are really attuned to that and, and, and others are not, and that's normal, you know, and it's just this wide spectrum, but it, the more you kind of attune to that and at go where those, hey, how are you doing? You know, you know, you seem really, you know, you know, really anxious about this. What is, is anything I could help you with? You know, go from there. Uh, so I'm going to give you the soapbox. I can give you a good layup to go go into uh, see if I could do whatever, a whatever. I'm not a basketball yeah, player. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an it's an analogy that I'm going to make it easy for you, Neil. There you go. All right. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, I know that you're really, I know that you're really passionate about this, right? And this, I, I'm going to lead you in with something that might sound, sound a little bit cliche, but I know that the mental health experts and the therapists and the, and the psychologists out there will, they, who are listening, this will kind of resonate with them. And I'm going to pose it in the form of a question and you can go wherever you want with it. You and I are both you one of the thing that we professionally share in common is is we're coaches, right? You have a, a vastly more diverse background than I than I do. But but at the end of the day, people are coming to us to kind of improve themselves athletically. Yeah. But I think a lot of the times more fundamentally, we have to think about it a lot more, a lot more deeply than I'm going to improve somebody's threshold speed by 5% in the next three months or something like that. And so the, the saying that kind of gets, that kind of gets thrown around that I think gets a little bit too much trite lip service that I want you to really opine on is, is there health without mental health? Oh, <laughs> no. That was, no, that was no, no. for the people who weren't no. listening during that. No. Like, why well, not? Why why, why not? not? I mean uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh you know, it, it we're, we're it's we're one. You know, the you know, the brain, the body, all work is one. Some people think, you know, try and separate some of this out. Um whenever you know, for, you know, and I kind of use, you know, just the, a lot, you know, for example, stress at home, stress at home is ultimately going to impact your training, you know, your, your physical situation, stress wears and tears on your body. We, you know, we know that increased stress, increased cortisol, all that, that's going to start you know, wearing and tearing you. That's going to impact your training too. Um, the, you're not going to be healthy physically if you're not taking care of your mental health. That it's not a cliche. It has to happen. And, and some people will deal with all that, you know, a lot of stuff differently. And some have dealt, developed some really good tools. Um, and, and some people may need some extra tools. And that's why you go see a therapist. That's why you go see a doctor. 
you know, hey, I, you know, I, I cut myself, it's infected, what do I do? You go and get a tool to fix it. You get medicine to fix that. Same thing with mental health. This is, you know, in, in order for us to work, to function uh, as athletes, as human beings, we need it all together. You know, all the mental health piece and the physical piece, it, you know, it, it's interconnected tremendously, you know, and I, you know, so many different areas where, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that my soapbox? Is that my, no, ten, you got me. Hey, I, like, I, exp I expected. Like, I'm not, I was like, yeah, this is, you know, you know so many different pieces of it. Yeah, so I many different pieces. Of I expected yeah. a twenty-minute soliloquy on that because normally, right. you know, that just like sends people like you kind of, kind of, kind of through the roof with things. It doesn't have to be. I mean, it just, it just is. <laughs> it just is. I, I think that's. I think that's yeah. really poetic, right? I mean, it just is. I've kind of. I don't know if I have the right take on this yet, but when I kind of like look at the order, rank order of priorities of you know, me helping somebody out. I don't necessarily put their physical output of anything at the top of the list. It's they've got to be a healthy person first. Because yeah. you can only you can only get away with it in the short term. Right? You can only have the discrepancy between physical health and mental health, regardless of where the discrepancy is. Right. right. You have great mental health, but poor physical health. It, and, and I realize that that's over trivializing the buckets, but work with me here. You have great physical health or poor mental health. You can only get away with that for so long. That is a, that is a temporary state of being before one side right. tears the other side down. Absolutely. And if you don't bring both sides to a adequately functioning state, it doesn't mean they have to be equal you know, but if you don't bring them to an adequately functioning state, it is just a matter of time before one side tears the other side down because they're so invariably linked. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If, if, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, I can't go, I mean, you can't go on, <laughs> on about it because it's, I mean, this is, yeah, to me, you know, I mean, I, I see it personally, I see it professionally, you know, that ultimately, you know, you, you know, there's a link in the chain, a weak link in the chain, you know, and we want that chain to be strong. And if you, that's why, go, you know, that's why I really, what I really appreciate is when someone goes and, and sees a therapist before things get bad, or even if there's nothing that's bad, you know, go in, hey, I just want, I'm doing my yearly checkup. I just want to talk, you know, here's some things that are going on. Oh, I have some great tools to, and and they get, they're on their way. You know, that's great. If I see someone for one session, two sessions, and they, they've got what they needed, that's a win, you know? You know, 10 sessions is a win, you know? That's great. But uh, if you're coming in for like a checkup, uh, you, another example is a premarital meeting, you know, couple coming in together, you know, that wants to talk and just get some tools. Oh, what a great way to start it off. You're going with all these tools now. Yeah, come back, you know, come back in a couple of years. Things are, you know, you're going to have a baby. Let's talk some more. Great. Here's some more tools before things get ever get bad. You know, yeah, that's you, you always, you always pay for the course correction four or tenfold, right? Exactly. Versus totally. like getting ahead of it. Like, you, you know, once again, all related to kind of like physical training, right? If for whatever reason you take six months off and all of a sudden you're 15% less fit, you're going to pay for that in four times the amount of time that it takes to improve 15%. Oh, yeah. It's just like, it's just so, <laughs> it's just so hard. So once yeah. again, kind of coming back to our earlier thesis that, you know, there is no health without mental health. I think this course correction piece, right. That we exactly. all too often attribute with physicality is absolutely right. true on the mental health side. If you get ahead of things, it's much, much easier to stay the course versus if you start falling behind. Get ahead of things. I mean, you know, you're feeling great. Okay, great. You know, go talk to someone. I mean, you know, there's so many people that don't even go in to see their, their medical doctor for a yearly physical. And, and, you know, and so that's a struggle right there. You know, Getting getting that blood work once a year, maybe twice a year for some athletes, or long, you know, at more intervals. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's, you know, we're 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 doing all that. We're spending 
you know, what, $500 a pop for, for like, a, you know, some extreme blood work. And, but, you know, for, you know, maybe, you know, an insurance copay or, or 50, $100 for therapist, you know, I'm saying, you know, average, that's once you just kind of do a check-in. That's a lot cheaper. You know, I'm going to sell therapy here. I'm not trying to sell myself, but I, I do think, you know, we put it on the back burner, you know, way more than our physical health. Well, it's not a marginal gain, right? I mean, yeah. the analogy that you just made to the blood work, I could come up, we could both come up with a hundred of them right now, right? Whether yeah. it's some pneumatic compression boots or a fancy oh. recovery smoothie or whatever, and not that they're mutually exclusive, right? but if you're like rack and stacking things, all of that stuff goes to the bottom and totally. making sure that your mental health is on par and you have good mental health is right. vastly superior to any of those modalities that you can kind of throw at yourself. Exactly. exactly. And you know, you know, yeah, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, yeah, sometimes it is a struggle to, to find a therapist, you know, but it's also a struggle sometimes to find the right doctor. You know, I, you know, I know people doing that too, or the right physical therapist. I went through a whole bunch before I got to Wanda, you know, that's my go-to, yeah. go-to physical therapist and go in there and out once or twice a year and I'm good. Um, but it's, it's, but you do like anything, you have to put in some legwork for it. You, you know, people come into us find a, to find a coach. They interview a couple coaches, you know, they may be interviewing coaches outside of us too. Yeah. And it takes work, you know. That's my next toolkit. I don't think I told you this. So, I mean, I've gone through like maybe probably for the last decade or so of my coaching career, I've been actively putting together toolkits. And one of them is physical therapists. So I've got yeah. this bank of physical therapists that I can lean on, right? And I'm always yeah. expanding that. One of them is a bank of sports psychologists. I've kind of put together, put, yeah. put that together. Another is a bank of like orthopedic specialists. You know, somebody's got to go in and get surgery. You know, I've got some people to lean on kind of there. The next one, and I, shame on me, bad coaching on my part uh, for not putting this higher on the priority list, but is a bank of people like yourself that I can reach out to and say, Hey, help me out with this. Where do I send this athlete to? Where do I send my friend to like things like that? Like that's something that I'm kind of actively working on. And I, I, I'm for I sure behind the curve on it. Yeah. I, I think it's tremendously helpful and, you know, kind of help and educate too. I mean, one thing that, that I've noticed, you know, as I've kind of gone into the, you know, the perform sport performance side and, the mental health side is that really clarifying for people kind of what some of the roles are. Now you do have sports, clinical sports psychologists who do some of the mental health work too. And then some that are very, very, very specifically, and I'm just performance oriented. And then you just have some, you know, people, you know, over here that just have the performance and some mental health, you know, and it's kind of nice to find that blend. You don't have to, you know, yeah, and, you know, I like kind of being in all these different worlds. I like having this kind of Venn diagram, which kind of being in the middle, of, you know, he's a coach and he does this, you know, and that way I'm getting to see all these different worlds and interact in that and learn, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it's really, yeah, having that bucket full of people and know, okay, this, this might be a good fit here and it's okay if it's not, tell your athlete you know, whoever you're, whoever you're, you know, you were talking as coaches, but if you're, you know, just talking to a friend, you know, Hey, this, this therapist, Hey, this won't work for me, but you know, there, there's like 10 other names here that may work for you better. You know, it's just, it's all chemistry. So Neil, let's try to like, let, let's try to put this in a little bit of a package. You know how I like to do that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's just sure. like, let's try, let's try, let's oh, try. To, you know how it is. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but let's try to, let, let's try to, let's try to reasonably like synopsize two, two things, right? And I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you do this because you're the expert here, obviously. First one is, is what are like the basic resources, right? What are the toolkits that athletes and, and, and people that want to help other people what can they look to, to just help them like navigate the space? Okay. Second thing is, is where do you advise somebody who is out there that is already raising their hand? We already went through how hard the whole thing is to navigate, but they're already raising their hand and they say, Hey, I want to get a better fix on this. Where do they start? So we'll start with the toolkits first. 
And then once the person's raised their hand and said, I need, I need to get a handle on this, what is their next step? So toolkits, you know, considering mental health is A, you know what the insurance, who, who their insurance is, you know, who your insurance is, who, you, if you have an employee assistance program, you know, I, and I, I, I think those are going to be extremely helpful resources. You can get online for a lot of, you know, things like Blue Cross Blue Shield or United or whoever and access those lists. Even if you don't have that person's insurance information, you should be able to log in and, and access the list as a guest. Sometimes, you know, the, the next resource too is going to something like Psychology Today. I mean, there, there's so many therapists that list themselves on Psychology Today. You can kind of narrow it down. Some are, you know, uh, you have the clinical, some have the sport information, the, you know, sports psychology side of it. But Psychology Today is a really great resource. And a lot of times those therapists will say if they're taking new clients or not. So that's a jump right there. Dr. Google, Dr. Google's another resource. Um, but your doctor, your medical doctor should have a list of resources. Your physical therapist should have a list of resources. Your chiropractor should have a list of resources. Go to those folks that you know already. You know, it lists, you know, if someone you know, listen to the person you're talking to, your neighbor said, oh, hey, this therapist, call your neighbor. So who was that therapist that you worked with? You know, you, you mentioned that person a couple of weeks ago. It's great to have that list. You should be able to get that, you know, uh, you know, going online to an insurance company should be able to get those. And then you start making those phone calls. And you could, you as an outsider can make the phone calls for that person. Hey, just want to check in to see if you've got any availability. You know, uh, before I refer this person, um, I know I've done that for uh, some of the, you know, some, some rats, you know, it's just like, okay, hey, hey, oh, great. You have availability. Awesome. Let's go that, you know, let, let's hear, here's a name, you know, um, and that's, that's a toolkit right there. Ask, ask, ask questions. You know, there's people there in the medical profession that know, have, know somebody. So now, now that we've got all these tools around us, right? You're going to insurance. Okay. Uh, you're going to the insurance companies. You've reached out to Psychology Today, or you've doc, you've Googled psych, whatever else is in Psychology Today, and you are trying to compile a list of therapists to go to. For the people out there that this is resonating with them, I need to go and have somebody help me with this. Where is their next move? Next move is picking up the phone. You know, some some people, some therapists can you could schedule online. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't personally have that kind of thing set up, but I, I do know some therapists have that set up. But I think calling them first, you got to you got to take that list and, and make those phone calls and introduce yourself to that person. I'm going to get closer here to my screen because I think it's really important to have ten, five. If you could talk five ten minutes to this person to see even if there's a little bit of a connection with that person, then, okay, you know the next step. You're going to go in. You can have a first appointment. They're going to ask you a lot of questions. You're going to ask you your life story sometimes. And, and sometimes they might, you know, let's just go right, you know, right to the heart of the matter. But they want to get some history from you. Where did this background come from? And then even after that first session, you may make a decision, you know, this didn't feel really good. It's okay to go find somebody else. Just like you went into that doctor and that doc, you, know, you don't have to go to the medical doctor that you just scheduled an appointment, you know, that you went in for. You could go on to see somebody else. It but may take one or two times. Yeah. Fund fundamentally, what you're saying is make a list and then curate the list. Curate right? the list. I mean, if, I mean that's, I mean, that's yeah. kind of what I'm getting out of that is, is like, yeah. make a list. You can, you, here are all these resources and I'll have these in the show notes for the people that are interested. Here's how you can make the list from all of these resources. And then once you have made that list, whether you are making it for yourself or you're making it for a friend, then that list needs to get curated somehow. And that curation is primarily facilitated by getting on the phone and talking to somebody for 15 minutes and seeing if there is some sort of, uh, some, some, some sort of connection between you yeah. and the therapist that you're going to speak with. This is, is the same way you establish the coaching relationship. You know, it's, no, it's it, a lot it, of good parallels. Yeah. You know, it, it's 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 the same thing. And yeah, and the thing is, and just like in the coaching relationship, I don't have any qualms. If someone doesn't want to work with me, that's okay. 
You know, if you if you come into my office and we spend a session or two together and you say, well, I need to find you, you need to connect in order for this to work. You need to connect with someone. And that's OK. That's human. You know, you, you don't hang out with some friends that, you know, or some people because you just don't connect with them. And that's OK. And I, I think that's important for people to understand as well, both on the coaching side and then this other this mental health side that we're talking about is, is the practitioners that are out there in the space, they want to help. And they, if they're doing their jobs correctly, I hate to say this because I'm not in this field. I say this about coaching all the time, but if they're doing their jobs correctly and for whatever reason they feel that they can't help or they feel that somebody else, one of their other colleagues is going to be a better fit or going to be able to help that person, yeah. it's their obligation. This is the way it's I view ethically, the coaching side. Ethically, yeah. it's my obligation. Eth yeah. Ethically, it's my obligation to refer on. You know, I have people say, well, you know, Neil, you know, kind of the sports side a little bit more. I'm going to refer over to you. Um, someone, know, you know, and I'll refer on to other people or, or that, you know, maybe the clients found somebody else and that's okay. You know, that I want, I want people to, a good fit. And that's, a, that's really important for people to understand because it takes a lot of this unknown burden off of them, right? If they can go, if they can go into realizing, we just talked about, you know, kind of on the onset of this podcast, how it is a little bit of work, right? You got to go find people, then you got to interview them, and there's a little bit of legwork and insurance mm -hmm. and all this stuff. You got to get to work for it. But if if they also know that the person who's on the other end of the line, they are going to help them navigate that process as well, even after only meeting them for five minutes. Right. That I think is that gives a lot of people comfort in starting that process because it is so new to them and they're afraid that they're going to make a mistake or they're going to find the wrong person or not find anybody and things like that. I, like realizing that this ecosystem is here to help you. I, I think, you know, another point too is, you know, we know that there are coaches out there that just, you know, some of them, okay, I'm going to use the phrase, they're bad, <laughs> you know, you know, and, and, or they're, you know, I don't want to say they're bad, but they may not have a great, you know, the personality or whatever it is. You may run into that with therapists. Okay, that's great. Move on to the next one. You yeah. don't don't feel like you ever have to go to one person. Check one or two out. I always encourage that. Now, let's see three or four at the same time. <laughs> that, that's not going to help you. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, just like seeing a coach, you have three or four coaches and say, that's not going to help you. That's not going to help. Well, you know, yeah. but you know, feel free. You know, go ahead and you know. Find someone who's a good fit. Don't get discouraged if you find someone who's just not fun, you know, not good to talk to on the phone, or they didn't give you the time of day, or they, you know, they tell you, I don't take your insurance, you know, something like that. Go ahead and find somebody that you're comfortable with. They're out there. They are definitely out there. Yeah. You don't have to hit a home run right out of the gate. Right. No. You gotta you gotta be willing to work for it a little bit. You might make a mistake, you might pick the wrong person at first, but it's just that's just part of the process like choosing any other practitioner to work with it, exactly and you know and, and maybe you, you're with someone that it, it, there's some a little discomfort but maybe you're getting some tools out of that too so i don't want you to just go don't get don't get discouraged we're here we're you know we're, we're, we're here to we're here to help you <laughs> in a lot of that, different ways <laughs> that's a great way to end it neil um is there anything else that you want to that you want to kind of like divulge to the listeners in terms of helping them navigate the space before we let you go? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that was it. We talked a, a lot uh, about the resources that are out there. Um, it's okay to ask. It's okay to, you know, call your insurance 20 times. You know, it's okay to, you know, you're not a burden by doing this. This is where, you know, people are out there to help you and they're all around you. So, I mean, I think that's the one thing to keep in mind um, that the resources are there. Well, Neil, th thanks for coming on. I'm going to let you get back to your dog. He seems like he's. He, I apologize. He's, he's, that's all good. That's, people, are, yes. pe pe people are used to it on Zoom, so it's not a big deal at all. Yeah, um, I didn't realize you're picking that one up. Usually, no, but, uh, no one hears it. It's all good, man. All good. Um, but no, I, what I, what I, in all seriousness, thank you for helping me curate this conversation 
yeah. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to do more of them because it's something that I've wanted to do with this podcast. There's a couple of areas that I've wanted to get more into, and this is and this yeah. is one of them because I think it does the listeners a service. It's easy to go to you because you and I have a coach to coach professional relationship, and right. so for that, I thank you professionally for taking no that problem. leap of faith with me. Thank me, you for, me thank you for asking me because you know this is this is you know working in this relationship is new to me. <laughs> and I, and I, I gotta, you know, you gotta be honest, you know, I've seen the email. I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate, I appreciate the organization that we're in here because I'm learning a ton. That's I've great. never done these podcasts before. <laughs> 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 like, you know, and well, you know, a little I, nerves, but you know, but it's that's what I'm here is to learn, you know. And uh, you, you speak a lot about mentors, and I'm like, I, I, I want to use you guys as my mentors, and if I could help you. This is, I mean, this is where I'm coming from is, is I want to be a resource to you all too. Yeah. That, and, that's, and, that, and that's what I was getting at is, is I really appreciate you being a resource to not only me, but to our, the rest of our coaching group in an area that we don't already have a lot of resources. We are probably under-resourced in that area compared to sports physiology and, you know, lactate, you know, metabolism yeah. and all this other stuff where we're kind of over-resourced. But I, I appreciate you coming in with your expertise and not only helping me out and help the listeners out uh, and helping this podcast kind of break into these water as well, but also to the kind of overall coaching group that we work with. So thank you. Yeah, we're no problem, you, sir. Yeah, we're going to let you yeah, go, yeah, man. I got to get to Abby here. She's getting a little crazy. <laughs> there you go. We'll let you, get, um, we'll let you get back to the dog. Go ahead. Yeah, one, one thing that I was thinking it's always good to mention that, you know, if, especially when you're talking about mental health is it can trigger some people sometimes is, you know, making sure people know right off the bat, Hey, you know, if something, you know, if you're getting triggered, you know, we want to know this resource is out for you immediately emergency resources, like the national suicide prevention hotline. I like, you know, just even mentioning that to people that that is a resource for you. And I could give you the number two right now, if you want, I got it. I got it written down. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, so where to go? The National Suicide Prevention Hotline is a 24-hour hotline, and it's uh, 800-273-8255. And uh, they're available 24-7. I think it's important for people to know that in an emergency, you know, that, that resource is there for them. I appreciate that, Neil. I'll put yeah, a link to no that problem. in the show notes as well okay. as uh, links to everything else in the show. All notes. right. Take care. Have a good yeah. one. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate this conversation, Neil. Enjoy Black Canyon. All right. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Neil for coming on the podcast today. Like I said, that was something that I really wanted to dip my toes in the water and get my feet wet before I explore this podcast or I explore this topic on this podcast more and more and more. And I could not think of anybody better to do that with than Neil. So I'm incredibly indebted to you for putting up with me for the first time discussing this on this podcast, the first time of which I am sure will be many. Thank you to all the listeners out there. I met a lot of you out at the Black Canyon 100K this weekend, and I am incredibly grateful for that. Thank you for those who came into the van and recorded a question that will get read live on the Coopcast at a later date and time. I'm really appreciative that I get to answer all of those questions for you guys. It was a real treat for me to run around the course and see uh, everybody that was out there. If you like this podcast, please, Share it with your friends, share it with your colleagues, share it with your training partners. You give it a like or a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps the podcast out a tremendous amount. But above and beyond all else, you guys, I hope that you guys got something valuable out of this podcast that you can take into your day-to-day -day lives. That's it for today, folks. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.